Good morning and a happy Sabbath to each one of you. It is, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. I um, appreciate it that we had a chance to have a, well, at least I thought it was a wonderful Sabbath school lesson. And uh, it was uh, nice to be able to uh, discuss uh, the things that uh, we as Christians uh, sometimes uh, have questions on. And yet, as we worship here together, we realize that uh, even though this morning there's a few of us uh, that aren't, aren't are normally here that are under the weather, Nicole and Jordan are enjoying a flu here today, and they thought that it would be uh, something to rather not share. Um, but um, I, a lot of these people are going to miss out on a wonderful potluck lunch here today, so I feel sorry for them. Um, so this morning after our service we'd like to invite you to uh, come and join us in the uh, fellowship room this morning though I, it is uh, a real privilege that i have uh, to ask for a uh, vote here we've had a first reading on the transfer of membership for ben and ashley walker to the suez church and so today uh, we're going to ask for a uh, a vote and before we do that I would like to ask for does anybody would like to make a motion that we accept them uh, in I see a motion and all in favor uh, I see everyone's hands up and any opposed well yeah, I have to ask that even though all the hands are up so <laughs> again we want to welcome you Ben and Ashley I appreciate you choosing the Suez area to live in and uh, this uh, fall, um, I understand you acquired some property here, and so this is uh, this is very good. And so, um, it is uh, nice to have uh, people join our church. And so this morning, it is really a privilege for me to be able to do that. <clears throat> this, I have, I'm going to ask our pastor to come up, and we have another um, a little announcement here that is in your bulletin, and one that uh, I'm very happy for also. Well, we are very happy that our sister Elizabeth has been ministering to this church for more than 25 years as a treasurer or in different capacities, but in the treasury department. So I know it's hard for her to say, now it's time for me to not do that anymore. Huh? It wasn't that hard. It wasn't that hard. <laughs> well. But it took a lot of prayer and thought, yes. 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 Yeah. That's what I meant. <laughs> and um, she will continue serving uh, in different capacities in, in our church. But we wanted to recognize her dedication and all this time where she has been serving. I think before I was born. No, that was 25 years ago, right? No, I was born. <laughs> Um, so uh, the church wants to uh, show your appreciation, your, show you its appreciation. So um, here's Rachel, and she's going to um, thank you in the in representation of the church. So don't, don't go away. Let's let's have a, a prayer, okay? Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of our sister Elizabeth. We thank you for her love for you and for her church and for each one of the members in the family. We pray that you will continue giving her the strength for every day and the joy of serving you in different capacities. We thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I appreciate you sharing that uh, with us this morning. Uh, there is, of course, one other uh, announcement that I'd like to highlight uh, this morning, and that is in your bulletin gym, gym night on February 3rd, and that's uh, at the Oliver Elementary School. So hopefully you'll be able to be part of that. Uh, I would like to um, uh, ask you to... Uh, um, enjoy a little health video that uh, we have lined up for you and uh, for those of you that were at our church business meeting that we had here this past week we got to enjoy the new uh, room that is being uh, upgraded and so it was very nice to be in there and I look forward to um, what is going to take place this uh, spring and so we're going to have a video at this time 
on sunshine. When the Beatles wrote the popular song, Here Comes the Sun, they might have been celebrating the sun's return to their rainy home in England. It's warm, it's bright, the sun is generally thought to be a pretty happy component in our everyday lives. But why do we need it? What makes it indispensable to our lives? Two words, vitamin D. A cholesterol-like compound in our blood that transforms into vitamin D when exposed to sunlight. This vitamin D is then converted to its active form by the liver and then by the kidneys. Well, that begs the question, why do we need vitamin D? What happens if you don't have enough? For years, we've understood vitamin D's role in regulating calcium levels and how a deficiency can cause both rickets and osteoporosis. Today, we know that vitamin D also has an important role as a steroid hormone in gene modulation. This means vitamin D can help turn on health-promoting genes while suppressing bad genes, especially oncogenes, a gene group that promotes cancer. And let us not forget vitamin D's very important role as an antioxidant. Sun exposure among men was studied in a recent cancer research article. Those receiving the most sun experienced a 50% reduction in prostate cancer relative to those who received the least sun. This is only one example as vitamin D has also been shown to reduce many other types of cancer. This doesn't mean that you should spend every minute of every day basking under the sun. Most people need to spend only a short time in the sun to maintain healthy vitamin D levels. Once a person makes enough vitamin D, any extra is turned into inactive substances. An adequate storage of vitamin D during summer months usually provides sufficient amounts for the winter months. There are two wavelengths of ultraviolet radiation that we should be aware of, UVA and UVB. The production of vitamin D requires UVB radiation, which is blocked by most sunscreens. It's the UVA rays that are not blocked by most sunscreens, yet are the most dangerous for most types of skin cancer. What this means is that by using a sunscreen product, you've reduced your vitamin D level. You've also done very little to decrease your risk for skin cancer. Ultimately, sunshine is important for cancer reduction, rickets prevention, and reducing osteoporosis. Moreover, Sunshine can also keep you happy. You might have heard of seasonal affective disorder, otherwise known as SAD or SAD. It's a type of depression that occurs at the same time every year, starting in the fall and then improving in the spring. This type of depression is energy draining and makes you feel moody, often for what frustratingly feels like no reason at all. If you're going through this now, go and try to find a patch of sun. SAD is caused by decreasing amounts of sunlight and colder weather. Providing bright light at the correct wavelength is called phototherapy. Researchers have found that this changes the chemistry of the brain while boosting vitamin D levels. In fact, phototherapy in the form of light boxes radically improves SAD. Phototherapy is an option, but choosing to have your home in an area where the sun often shines is ideal. It's understandable that not everyone can live next to a sunny beach, but we encourage you to do your best to make sun a priority. Incorporate just 20 to 30 minutes of natural warmth bringing and mood lifting sunlight in your life and see how it works to lead you down a path of wellness. Frank Starr Bond and his brother Walter were the first missionaries who brought the Adventist message to Spain. One of 12 children, Frank was born in the United States into a large Californian family. He earned a degree in theology in 1899 from Healdsburg College, now Pacific Union College. At a camp meeting in Fresno, Pastor Arthur G. Daniels, the president of the General Conference, called for volunteers to go preach the Adventist message in new territories. 
Frank, and Walter volunteered. Because they had worked among Hispanics in Arizona and Nevada and had some knowledge of the Spanish language, they were sent to be the first to preach the Adventist message in Spain. Frank was 27 when they arrived in Barcelona in 1903. Before long, they moved to the city of Sabado, where they established a school. Missionary work, coal porter ministry, and public lectures soon bore fruit, and three people were baptized. Two years after his arrival, Frank fell ill with smallpox and had to return to the United States. One year later, he returned to Spain healthy and now married to Martha M. Farnsworth. Soon after Frank was ordained to the ministry, he moved with his family to the province of Teruel, where he baptized several families the following year. Their descendants would later become pastors. In 1912, Frank helped establish the first two churches in Spain, the first in Barcelona and the second in Jarica. While living in eastern Spain, Frank and Martha had a daughter and two years later a son. Frank became the second president of the Spanish mission and worked in Spain until 1923 when exhausted from work and sick, he returned to the United States. After a life of service which included pastoring and evangelizing, he died in Fresno, California on April 25, 1924. Frank Star Bond and his family's legacy is still felt in Spain, where today there are more than 17,000 Adventists. However, an increasing number of people in this country claim no religion at all. Please pray for the work in Spain as Adventists spread a message of hope. To read the entire story about Frank Star Bond and other articles, visit the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists at encyclopedia.adventist.org. next song this morning is also going to be found in the hymnal, and it is song number 430, Joy By and By. Joy. 
Our next song is found in the hymnal, and it's one that I love to sing. Song number 262, There's a Sweet, Sweet Spirit. song today is also on our hymnal and it is song number 524 tis so sweet to trust in jesus please stand that Sister Andrews is here again this morning. She may be retired, but not off of complete duty. And so this morning, we're, she's going to share with us our scripture. And it's taken from Psalms chapter 1. This is a whole chapter. And of all the Psalms, I think this is one of the most interesting Psalms um, that uh, exists. So Sister Andrews, the time is over. If you would turn with me to Psalm 1 and read along as I read it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does 
shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Mm. May God add his blessing to his word. Thank you, Sister Andrews. Pastor, we're glad that you're here and the time is yours. Sometimes we are driving in this uh, weather and we try to avoid some potholes, uh, some ice. Uh, people ask the question, if you are driving and you see a dog in a, in a cad, who would you run over? And you know the answer, neither of them, right? But we try to avoid things. Sometimes we avoid situations. We should avoid debt. We should avoid um, situations that make us, um, um, that, that are risky. And sometimes, unfortunately, we avoid people. Because maybe we try to protect, our, protect ourselves so for any other reason, good or bad. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to say that what I'm going to say is that we avoid things, situations, and people sometimes because we are trying to avoid going through an unpleasant experience. But the title of my sermon, sermon is Two Reasons Why Not to Avoid God. Is there any bad reason that we should have or any reason at all to avoid God? Because God is good. The Bible says he is the father of lights. All good gifts come from him. Shall we be worried about not trying to avoid God? Well, we uh, read in the scripture today, this psalm, and the first part of the psalm um, describes the righteous people, the good people, the nice guys. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Very high standard, right? To be righteous. And then it says, he, the righteous person, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Would you like, do, do you like that description? That's the description of the righteous. But you know, sometimes we try to avoid God because we don't feel we are measuring up to this standard. How many of us, at, that, at some point in our lives, have tried to avoid the police because we are going over the speed limit? Or sometimes we are trying to avoid well, I remember when I was a child, that means I have a good memory because that was a long time ago. I remember when I was a child and my father would come home and I, I knew I, didn't, I had not been behaving. I was trying to avoid him, right? Because I didn't feel I was measuring up to what he expected and I knew there were consequences coming. In the Bible, we, we find, like in Romans uh, chapter 6, verse, verse 23, that um, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we know that the consequences of sin are not good. And I, I want to propose to you that... Sometimes we try to avoid God because of that. Now, let me go a little bit 
um, let me go forward with a reading. The second part of Psalm 1 describes the unrighteous, the bad people, and says the ungodly are not so, not so as the righteous, but are like the chaff with the wind which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And the psalm concludes summarizing these two descriptions. One says, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So I think there are two reasons why sometimes we should remember not to avoid God. One is when we think that what we have done is very bad. As I was mentioning, you know, my father was coming home. I knew I had done something wrong and I tried to avoid him. And when this description of the righteous person is in front of us, and when we are conscientious, or we are conscious, I better say, of what that means, we could try to avoid God because we know we are not perfect. And, uh, you know, sometimes we avoid God even though we don't avoid church. In other words, we know that we are not perfect, we know that we are sinful, and we don't know how to deal with that. But we put on our church, uh, what, the church dress or whatever, and then we come to church, but inside way we are avoiding God because we are not happy with ourselves. So, we know that the good, or the sinners, I'm, I'd rather say, the sinners will be destroyed by God's presence. We know that sin cannot remain in God's presence. We are afraid, we are also ashamed of what we may have done. But at this point, I want to invite you to think about God's friends. You know, through the study of the book of Psalms, we have been learning that God had or has a lot of friends that are not of a good reputation. Help me out. What was Abraham or how, what was he like? Did he do everything perfect? Pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> you know that he allowed his wife to be in danger of somebody else sleeping with her just to help him to be in a better financial position. Is that a very bad sin? Of course it is. What about Moses? We remember him as being the greatest man because he was a very patient and, and close to God. But do you remember that he killed somebody? Now, remember David. The lesson is talking about the psalmist, David. He wanted to marry somebody, and the requirement for his approval was what? Kill 200 people. Just 200 people. Philistines. And he went and killed 200 people at random and brought the proof of the 200 and then, and those were, in the Old Testament, friends of God. What about in the New Testament? You know what, one of, what was one of the nicknames of John and his brother? Sons of Thunder. Man, they were really, really explosive. Now, what about Mary Magdalene? Was she of a good reputation? Why? Because she didn't have a good reputation. That's why. 
and those were the friends of God. Now, when we think that we have done something really bad, and we try to avoid unconsciously avoid God, let's remember that God's friends were people that were bad. In other words, we are in good company. God would not be scandalized or shocked by, by the things that we have done. You know, sometimes we don't want to come to God because, ooh, what I did is terrible. God won't be shocked by that. And the proof for that is that all his friends have very, very bad experiences and still remain his friends. So the kind of persons that you have as a friend will tell us what kind of person you are. The same with God. But the difference is that God would transform them. And the character of the psalmists, you know, like David and others, shows that God values relationships more than behavior. It, it doesn't, I don't mean that God doesn't care about behavior, but God values relationships more than behavior. That's why in his relationship with all these friends, he blessed them and transformed them unto his image. I remember the story, imaginary story, that uh, I read in a devotional years ago of a sinner who comes to God and says in prayer, Lord, I am here to ask for forgiveness. You know what I, I have done? I am a sinner. I want you to forgive me. And the Lord says, I forgive you. So he goes, this person goes on his way, in his way. And then the next day, he comes back all discouraged and says, Lord, I am here again to ask for forgiveness. And God says, again? This is the first time I see you. Amen? It doesn't matter what we have done. We should not avoid God. Because he invites us to come to him in Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Whatever you have done, do not avoid God. But then, the other thing that sometimes make us, makes us avoid avoiding God is that you remember, right? The book, the, the Psalm 1 chapter, I mean, the Psalm the first psalm we read, first there is the description of the righteous person, then the description of the unrighteous, and then the result, right? The righteous will be blessed, and the unrighteous will be destroyed. Well, and I heard several comments about this in, in, during the Sabbath school discussion, but what happens when we don't see that happening? The righteous person is not blessed all the time. And the unrighteous person many times is the successful one. So we, I'm not going to talk about that particular question. But I'm going to talk about the reaction that produces in us. Sometimes we wonder and we say, God, why did you allow this to happen? And even in, in the book of Psalms, in uh, Psalm 73, 
um, David was, um, I'm sorry, Asaph was saying, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So when we struggle with this, sometimes the thought, and probably many times, that questioning, questioning thoughts come, in, come, come to our minds. God, why did you allow this to happen? I know we, we are not saved by works. I know we have to trust in you. I know that, but why? A friend of mine, a pastor, was my ministerial secretary or director years ago in another conference. He was telling us a very interesting story. He said that he, has, he had another friend, another pastor friend, uh, middle age, his friend had a little girl about five years old. And um, this friend of my pastor friend was driving on the highway and he got, uh, um, the tire was punched. So, how do you say that, punch? Yeah, what? Puncture, okay, thank you. Yeah. And um, so, in other words, he got a flat tire. And he stopped by the highway. And he was changing the tire while her, his little girl, five years old, was looking at him through the window, admiring his, her daddy changing the tire. When suddenly a big semi truck went off the road, hit this pastor, sent him about 30 feet away and killed him while his little girl was watching. So my pastor friend, whose friend has died in front of his girl, his little girl, got very, very upset at God. He couldn't deal with that. And he said that he got to a point in his struggle that he felt that if he would be close to God, he will slap, slap God in the face. That was his anger. And then he realized that to be close to God, to be able to hit him, he would be very, very close to God. And he melted. And he realized that he has come very, very close to God. Not praising him, not worshiping him, but complaining and reclaiming, I mean, I'm complaining and asking him why he allowed that to happen to his, to his friend. Now, <clears throat> Let me ask you, sometimes when we pray at night, we say, Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. Or we say, Lord, we had a difficult time, but thank you, because at the end of the day, at least we are alive. Somehow we try to justify the things that don't go right during the day. Because we are fearful that if we say the wrong thing to God, he may get mad at us. So we don't tell him our struggles. We thank God for his blessings and also for the problems. Oh, how nice 
we are, right? We are a good boy, a good, good girl, because even though you are struggling, you thank God for those struggles. But deep in, the, in our hearts, we are not that happy. We are not that thankful. We are questioning God. We are wondering, what kind of God is this? I know, I believe in God, but why, why he allowed this to happen? And, and that's my point. When we don't open our heart to God, when we try to say things that we think he wants us to say, we are avoiding God. Because we are afraid, not only to be disrespectful, but afraid that we may have doubts, or admit we have doubts about the way God treats his people. But in Psalm 73, when we were reading that... um, Asaph, was, who wrote this psalm, said, I almost slipped because I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Then he says later, when I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. In this case, he understood that at the end, everything will be okay. But what about today? Why is that God allows this to happen today? Now, uh, we studied a a couple weeks ago um, in the South School lesson, uh, Psalm 44. And I I like to ask you, what what would you think if we use this psalm as the scripture reading for our service? If you open your Bibles in Psalm 44, it says... Verse 1, we have heard with our ears, O God. Our fathers have told us the deeds you did in their days, in days of old. Amen? But what he is saying is, we know you can do this. You know, we know you can help us. But then at the end of Psalm, he's saying, how come you don't respond? In um, verse um, 17, all this has come upon us, but we have not forgotten you, nor have we dealt falsely with your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. In other words, sometimes we say, oh man, he was very faithful. Even though he was facing difficulties, he said, we have not departed. No, what he's saying is, we had been faithful to you, and in verse 19, but you have severely, severe, sorry, severely broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with a shadow of death. So we have been faithful to you. And look at what you are doing. Would you say amen if we read this in church? 20, verse 20 says, If we had forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hands to a foreign God, would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Awake, why do you sleep, O Lord? Arise, do not cast us off forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our affliction and our oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our body clings to the ground. Arise for our help and redeem us for your mercy's sake. Close. There's no verse that says, and God responded and helped him and delivered them. No. That's it. So what can we learn from this? What we can learn is that... um, If God values relationship more than behavior, we also need to remember that God values authenticity 
more than performance. We can avoid God and try to pretend that we are faithful Christians and we endure all the trials. But what God wants more than that is authenticity. For us to tell the Lord, Lord, I am mad. I don't know what, why is this happening? Do you know that there is one of the psalmists that says, Lord, I wish I have a sword. This is my words. I can split up, open the, wo- the womb of a woman that is pregnant. Take, your, take that baby and throw him against the rocks. Is that good? No. But he is telling God that. Do you think God says, Oh, bad boy, you, you shouldn't be even thinking about it. Did he say that? No. What God wants from us is authenticity. Because when we talk to God about those things, he doesn't share those things with anybody. If we share those feelings with a friend of ours, maybe that friend will get mad at the person that we are talking or we're, we're talking about. Or, or somebody else will share that and finally the person that we are talking about will hear that. It will be a big mess. But God listens not only our words, but our, our heart. And when we talk to God with authenticity, he will bring peace to our hearts. He will transform our hearts. And then we will say, oh Lord, I am sorry I had those feelings. But we need to be authentic before God. That's why Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29 says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, heavy laden, laden, laden or laden? Laden. Heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So it doesn't say, you know, solve your problems, calm down, get your thoughts straight, and then come and pray. No. He says, come to me as you are with all your thoughts, with all your frustrations, with all your thinking about me. Negative thinking. Like my pastor friend that was so mad at God that wanted to hit him. And God says, come to me. I will give you rest. So sometimes we might feel unworthy of coming to Jesus because we feel we do not measure up to the expectations. We realized We are not righteous and might be tempted to avoid God. Don't. Please don't. He is not scandalized or shocked by our deeds. He is bigger than our sins. Sometimes we might feel he is upset at us because we are having thoughts of distrust or we might be even questioning God's actions or the lack of them and might be tempted to avoid God. Don't. Please don't. He is bigger than our negative feelings towards him or disrespectful thoughts about him. There are two reasons why not to avoid God. He loves you and knows you and he values relationships over behavior. And he values authenticity over performance. Those are two very important reasons why not to avoid God. Let's come to the Lord in trust. Let's come to the Lord as the song that we sang at the beginning says, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. And then the song that we are going to sing, everything we can tell him in prayer, everything. So instead of avoiding him, let's come to him to be cleansed, to receive his peace and his transformation. I'd like to invite you once again 
and ask you, how many of you would like to commit again to study the Word of God in a personal, intentional way? Let's, let's use the, the study guide of the Sabbath school lesson to study the book of Psalms. And we will find more and more teachings from the Bible, teachings from God, as we have uh, learned this morning the reasons why not to avoid God. And then we will be blessed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because you want to have a relationship with us. And we thank you because you accept, accept us as we are and forgive us for all our sins. And we thank you because you want us to be authentic. We pray that you will give us that authenticity so we can open to you we can talk to you in an open way and have that communication that only friends have. We pray that you will help us to continue studying your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our closing song, song, num song number 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Father in heaven, thank you again for loving us and wanting to have a friend, uh, relationship with us. Help us to be authentic with you, come to you in trust, to deal with our sins before you. And also, if we have thoughts that make us feel guilty, because we have questions. Help us to remember that, we, that you value authenticity and we can talk to you as a friend. Thank you for giving us reasons not to avoid you. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.